We're going to take a look in this video at the physical features of Kenilworth between 1266 and 1575. So we want to know what was built in this time, who built it and why. What can it tell us about who lived here, what the region and country was like at the time, and importantly, how has Kenilworth changed over this period? Before we do this, uh, let's do a quick recap of the previous video where we looked at the building carried out in Kenilworth's first 150 years of existence. And in particular, uh, we looked at the building work undertaken by Geoffrey de Clinton, first of all, and then by John I. So here are the six main building developments which we looked at. Just pause the video for a moment and decide which ones were completed under Geoffrey de Clinton in the 1120s and which ones were completed under John I in the 1210s. Okay, let's have a quick check. So the causeway, first of all, is part of the initial building of Kenilworth. Mortimer's Tower, meanwhile, is one of the developments of John I. This is the entranceway which strengthens the castle's defense. Next, the Great Tower, this is Geoffrey de Clinton, this is that major first initial uh, stone building. And then we've got the Mere, also uh, one of the initial constructions under Geoffrey de Clinton. Then we've got Lund's Tower and the Outer Curtain Wall. These are both developed by John I. These are uh, things which really strengthen the defence of the castle in the 1210s. Well done if you got all those right. Um, if you're not sure, you've got any of those um, mixed up a little bit or aren't sure what any of those are, do make sure that you review um, the other video just to make sure that you know um, about those important buildings. Okay, so today, moving on, um, we are gonna focus on what happens after 1266. So we'll start here, and this is a moment we really need to remember as being a crucial turning point. Can you remember why? How does the castle's purpose change after this date? Well, we describe this as a turning point where Kenilworth changes from being a military castle to being a palatial one. Let's pause the video and like you just to write down answers to these two questions. We'll see how many of the kinds of buildings you thought um, actually do get built in that second question. First of all, though, let's look at what palatial means. So we've previously described palatial like this, something that is like a palace, something that's spacious, uh, beautiful decorations, a place suitable for the very powerful and rich uh, to live in. The building developments and physical features we're gonna look at here in this video can all be described as palatial. We're gonna look specifically at work done by John of Gaunt, the rich and powerful nobleman. We'll then look at King Henry V. He's the guy who gets sent the tennis balls by the French, um, gets sent to Kenilworth. And finally, we'll look at a man I'm sure you remember, Robert Dudley, and the work he did to try and impress uh, Elizabeth I. Let's look at John of Gaunt first of all. So until the later stages in his life, John actually spent most of his time abroad fighting, but still work continued at his residence at Kenilworth. Some people have suggested this work may have been in part, in part to please his wife, um, who otherwise was pretty unhappy about John's well-known adultery in the 1370s. Whatever the reasons for it, and that may have been part of it, um, this is how the buildings constructed under him have been described. And this is a, a really important way to think about what happened at this time. It says, his building developments at Kenilworth represent the finest survival of an English royal palace of the later Middle Ages. So his work is, is built to really reinforce Kenilworth's position of power and wealth. It represents his own power and wealth. And the work that he does and the people that spend time um, in those buildings are some of the most important people in medieval Britain, medieval monarchs and, and later Tudor kings as well. We're going to start by looking at John of Gaunt's Great Hall, um, which we can see is this part of the building. Today you could walk into its ruins and feel like this is just another ruined building, 
But this was one of the finest, most majestic buildings in all of England, in all of England at its time. And it really represented the most modern and cutting edge architectural design. When we look at some of the details, hopefully some of this past grandeur can kind of come to life. Um, the design and the scale really show how powerful and rich John of Gaunt was. This is the kind of building you'd expect a king to have made for himself. We should remember, um, although he's not the King of England, John of Gaunt did have a claim to be King of Spain at the time and certainly thought of himself um, up there on that, on that kind of level. So let's look at the Great Hall in a bit more detail. One of the first things that would strike you about this Great Hall is the size and beauty of the windows. These are the kinds of windows you'd expect to see in a huge cathedral. From the inside, they'd allow huge amounts of light in and they would kind of reflect through delicate shapes and colours in the glass. People reflected and spoke about just this amazing beauty um, of these windows. Around the windows, and we can see here a picture from kind of the inside of, of what is remains of the building. Around the windows we can see here would have been seating areas, benches. What we see here, what we see here in this picture um, actually is kind of a little bit misleading because the hall would have been on the first floor today. So there would have been kind of a line there. Um, here we can see kind of, imagine this is kind of like the floor. You would enter through a dramatic entrance, a 20 step stairway through this archway over here. And this was carved and decorated with beautiful uh, plant foliage and other designs, a really kind of dramatic and beautiful entrance to this, uh, to this amazing hall. There were six huge fireplaces and these would keep the room warm in winter. We can see one of them there. These would have been an amazing sight, roaring fires throughout the huge room. The walls would have been decorated with huge, rich tapestries of deep colours, the most expensive and desired decoration of the era. And finally, um, we need to imagine this room as having a beautiful roof, um, a really grand, huge, open spaced roof. Um, and we can see in the ruins here where it would have been built into. This hall was for special occasions. Food would have been served in an elaborate ritual accompanied by music. John even had his own group of musicians just for this purpose. Banquets would have been followed by entertainment, so dancing, dramatic performances, and guests would have been able to, uh, able to kind of sit up on like a heightened level to look down and watch the entertainment from the sides. This image isn't from Kenilworth, but it does show John of Gaunt actually in a different, um, highly decorated hall. And it can give us some idea of what things may have looked like. Uh, maybe it might have looked a bit more like this. Um, we have to try and, uh, and add this uh, imagination to the ruins we see today. Later on in this video, we're going to come on to look at the developments made by Robert Dudley, which he hoped would impress Elizabeth I. At this point, though, it's worth noting that Dudley basically changed nearly all parts of the castle. The bit he doesn't change is this great hall made by John of Gaunt, made 200 years earlier. This tells us how magnificent it was. It was still good enough for Dudley to show to Elizabeth. And here um, on the picture here, we can see Dudley in the middle. He is showing Elizabeth into the great hall. The next building we're going to look at that John of Gaunt was responsible for is the huge kitchen. Again, this image is not of Kenilworth, but it's a depiction of the kitchen at Windsor Castle. And this is somewhere that really influenced John of Gaunt's building style. We can get a good impression of what the kitchen may have looked like from this. The one at Kenilworth was large enough to feed several hundred people. This is a kitchen made for huge banquets, entertaining guests on a real massive scale and also really showing off. We can still see today a bread oven, three huge fireplaces, and we can see where a cauldron would have cooked the meat. From the kitchen, food would be taken to a small room called the dresser. Here it would be arranged before being taken to the great hall through a direct passage. The kitchen had to be kept a bit away, um, though, to minimize the risk of fire. Right next to the kitchens is what is known as the strong tower. It got its name from the fact that the floors are kind of vaulted in stone. We can see a little bit in this image here. This is a really unusual architectural technique. The thing about this building is 
um, it had a, a larder in the cellar. So it would stay cool thanks to kind of really thick walls and little direct sunlight getting in. So it's a perfect place to store food, the kind of the meat and fish, which would have been a, a massive part of any nobleman's diets and certainly filling up the tables and these amazing banquets for several hundred people that, uh, that there were at Kenilworth. The strong tower also housed several other rooms for storing drinks. Um, and then also all of the kind of plates, the cups, the cutlery, etc needed for the festivities in the Great Hall next door. Finally, the Strong Tower also had lodging rooms for senior household staff. From here, they would keep an eye over all of the staff working for the Lord. So we can see and have a look now at a kind of bird's eye view of the castle. And we can see um, that the kitchen here is directly linked through the strong tower where the food was stored, the food would get kind of prepared, and then it can be led directly into the great hall there. These three buildings, the kitchen, the strong tower, and the great hall, these are our most important ones to remember when we think about John of Gaunt and the work done in the late 14th century. They tell us about the palatial use of the castle in this era and the wealth and power of its owner. He's also responsible for two further developments that's worth us just knowing a little bit about. Um, St. Low Tower, which we can see here, and then the state apartments. These held living apartments, first for staff in that St. Low Tower there, and then for the Lord and his family in the state apartments. Okay, we're gonna take a pause now. Um, I want you to read through and complete this activity. When you are done, you can continue with the video. Next up, we're going to look at Henry V, and there's just one building actually we're going to um, focus on from this time. That is the Pleasance in the Marsh, and this is built for Henry V. Its only purpose is for private entertainment. Now, this building is like the definition of palatial. It would hold banquets, festivities, and it's a place of relaxation and retreat for the king. One of the interesting things about this, uh, about this Pleasance is it's kind of inspired by drawings, by stories, and by reports of garden palaces in Islamic Spain. The style of these had become popular in Northern Europe. And this can tell us about the fashion and the spread of ideas at this time. This presence was unfortunately for us abandoned a hundred or so years later in the time of Henry VIII. And now there are no remains apart from the earthworks. So it's a harder part of the castle for historians to be really sure about exactly what it was like. Finally, for this video, we're going to look at the building developments uh, that were undertaken by Robert Dudley. At this stage, again, I just want you to pause the video for a second to look at this image and identify what new features can you see. Okay, well done if you've picked out the garden, so the Elizabethan gardens, which we've discussed previously. We've got uh, Leicester's building over here, we've got Leicester's gatehouse, and we've got the stable. Now at this point, just a quick reminder, important for us to get this right, um, these are known as Leicester's buildings because Robert Dudley's title is the Earl of Leicester. Just quickly on the stable uh, at the bottom there, this would have had room for up to 50 horses, and it tells us how horse riding was a favoured hobby and a pastime for the rich and wealthy of England. Horses would have been used for hunting, and uh, it was a particular hobby of Elizabeth I. Here though, we're gonna focus our attention on the other two buildings. Firstly, Leicester's building. Again, today we see this just as a ruin, but this was an incredible, incredible building. This is a palace really fit for a queen. It's a four-story building, and it's built exclusively for Elizabeth and her entourage for her visits to Kenilworth. A famous description for the time from the time talks about how during the day, the building glistened with lights through the large windows, and then at nighttime, the candles, torchlights, and fires bringing light, warmth, and a kind of romantic spirit flooding through the building. Unfortunately for Robert, as we know, none of this was enough to get Elizabeth's hand in marriage. 
but oh well, um, what can you do? Let's look at the building from inside and we could just see a few things in this picture. Um, the Queen's room was up here, had a fine view over the castle, plenty of light flooding in, and it was decorated immaculately to the Queen's tastes and fitted with the best, most expensive products available. We have marble fireplaces, would have been chandeliers and beautiful tapestries. Knowing how much Elizabeth loved to dance, Robert Dudley also um, even built a dance studio on the floor above. It would have been up here. Finally, now we've looked at Leicester's building, let's look at Leicester's gatehouse. Unlike Leicester's building, which was largely ruined in the slighting of Kenilworth by parliamentarians in the Civil War, Leicester's gatehouse still stands today. It was turned into a house by Colonel Hawksworth, one of the parliamentarian leaders in the region after the war. The gatehouse was how Elizabeth would have entered and left the castle. There was a large and beautiful gateway, big enough for royal carriages to pass through. It was a fashionable and kind of a symbol of power to make a gatehouse like this have some similarities with older medieval castles which were built for war. However, a closer look makes it very clear this is a palatial building. There are no uh, real kind of defensive elements to the entranceways, and also there are huge windows overlooking the walls. In the doorway here, we see the level of detail that went into Robert Dudley's buildings at Kenilworth. There's an R for Robert, we can see here, on one side of the door, and there's an L on the other side. R for Robert, L for Leicester, carved into the door to his gatehouse here. Again, looking at this bird's eye view map, we can see where these two major buildings are. So we have um, Leicester's gatehouse providing a new entranceway to the castle over here. And Leicester's building is built kind of the other side. So you'd come through the gatehouse and you would see the beautiful majestic Leicester's building as you came in. The Leicester's building, as we can see, is built kind of next to and in fact joining um, some of those buildings that were constructed nearly 200 years earlier by John of Gaunt's. With Dudley's buildings, Kenilworth kind of reaches its height in terms of beauty, size, and stature. After this, its fate would soon be one of, kind of destruction uh, and ruin. So now that we've looked at these major building developments during this palatial period of Kenilworth's history, here are two questions for you to answer. So number one, I want you to focus on what the building developments that are made between 1266 and 1575, what do they tell us about the people who lived at Kenilworth and what the castle was used for in this time? So to answer this question, you're gonna to need to choose three buildings that we've looked at in this video to explain your answer. Second of all, and this is a slightly harder question, um, I want you to think about what challenges there are in terms of the physical remains of the castle for historians trying to understand what happened at Kenilworth Castle over time. For this one, you need to think about what state the building's currently in. Um, you have to think about the fact that buildings have changed over time in the same space. For example, Robert Dudley renovating most of the castle apart from the Great Hall. And you also have to think about what records are there that I've been able to share with you in this video, but also what records aren't there that, that might lead it to be more difficult for historians to be exactly sure of what Kenilworth was like. So, good luck with those questions, um, have a good go, and look forward to reading them.